Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Brass 101. Thank you for joining us this evening. We have a great program coming up over the next 75 minutes. Just a few housekeeping notes uh, before we start. We have one more Brass 101 coming up, and that will be next Tuesday, uh, the 16th. Ben Pritchett from Colorado will be our Avalanche Safety Educator, and we are proud to welcome next week River Radimus as our U.S. Ski Team guest. Uh, he will be uh, telling us a little bit about his recent top 10 finish in Solden and also his amazing performance at the Youth Olympic Games a few weeks back. Coming up tonight, we'll have Lindsey Mann coming up in just a few minutes, and we have an amazing athlete story for you tonight. That will be Stephen Nyman, and he'll be coming up after the educational portion of tonight's program. We want to encourage all of you, if you find this to be a worthwhile endeavor and good education for you as we head into the season, don't be bashful about sending a donation to Brass. You can just go to BrassAvalanche.org and also tell your friends and have them tune in next week on Tuesday the 16th at 6 p.m. Mountain Time for our final session of the evening. We also will have a great program coming up on Bryce and Ronnie Day. That is on uh, January 5th right after the new year and watch for an announcement on that in the coming weeks. Without further ado to kick it off tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce Ronnie's mom, Cindy Burlack. Cindy has brought a lot of passion into this program over the last few years. She's the originator of Brass 101. We really appreciate all that she's done. So Cindy, let's have you kick it off. Thanks so much, Tom, and welcome everybody. It's so good to have you here with us tonight. Tom, you're amazing to bring us all together with your knowledge of technology and publicity. Thank you so much. We at Brass, which is the Bryce Ronnie Athlete Snow Safety Foundation, want you to become aware of the basic snow safety concepts while you're having fun in the snow. We want to inspire you to take more classes. We wish with all our hearts, Bryce Astle and our son Ronnie Burlock had watched this program before January 5th, 2015. Neither they nor their US ski team coaches were aware of the snow danger that day in Austria. And no one knew that such a simple program as this could save lives. Because of that, the Astles, along with Steve Carolyn and I are steeped in heartache forever. We're joined by a huge community of ski racing enthusiasts, and some of them, some of you are here with us tonight. So please listen carefully for your own sake and that of your families. Be unafraid to talk to your buddies about what you learn here. We'd like to thank our partners who make this all possible, Utah Avalanche Center, Blizz Tech, BCA, World Cup Supply, Northern Vermont University, and veteran downhiller Stephen Nyman, who's on our board of directors. He lends his heartfelt support for Avalanche Safety and is appearing here tonight with us. We're proud to present our, our host tonight, our presenter, who is a Dartmouth College ski racer. She was part of the NCAA championship team in 2007. She's been an alpine ski coach since then and been a mountain guide all over North America since 2009. She's a certified area instructor from Haley, Idaho and recently married. Here's Lindsay Mann Davis. Thank you. Thanks, Cindy. And thank you, Tom. And thank you to the Brass Foundation. And thank you to everyone who's joining us tonight. Um, we wanted to... Yeah, we just really appreciate everyone coming on, especially as I know that we got some snow here in Haley today. So it's definitely a great time to start thinking about snow and avalanche conditions and refresh or listen in to these presentations for the first time. So thank you for being here. I wanted to start out with a statistic that you're going to hear come up a couple times throughout this presentation. Um, and that statistic is that 90% of avalanche accidents are triggered by the victim or someone in the victim's group, which is actually a pretty positive statistic to me. It means that we can work to prevent being caught in avalanches and we can hopefully make this statistic better moving forward. 
So we're gonna start out with a video from No Before You Go, and hopefully bear with me with any technology glitches, but hopefully everything plays well on your screens. So what is an avalanche? There's a lot of different kinds of avalanches, but the kind that causes the most trouble are what we call dry slab avalanches. A slab avalanche is like a monster in a horror film. It lies underneath the perfect facade, this enticing powder. It's just waiting for a trigger to come along, like you, to collapse that weak layer, and then that collapse just goes outwards in all directions. The slope just shadows like a pane of glass. There's no escape. It rockets down the hill, bounces you off trees and rocks on the way down, comes with you over a cliff. I mean, does any of that sound dangerous to you? I was not aware, and I did not comprehend the dangers that were out there that day. When I triggered the avalanche, it wrapped me up immediately. Not a second later, I was hit in the back with what well, felt like a truck. I didn't even have a chance. I ended up laying there in the snow with two broken femurs and my broken left arm for between seven and eight hours. I had a total of four surgeries, still in therapy three days a week, trying to learn how to walk again and get use of my body again. Avalanches are very violent events. One out of four people are killed by the trauma of hitting trees and rocks on the way down. And after they tumble you to the bottom, then the avalanche debris instantly sets up like concrete. You can't just pop off out of this. Somebody else has to get you out of the snow. Really fun day. It was beautiful powder snow, blue skies, sunshine, just pow shots, nothing extreme. We were trying to get gnarly or anything. Came around the corner, dropped in. It was great. And then saw cracks shoot out all around me. I did see like the sky for a moment and then just a whole wave of snow went over my face. I had like a moment of, ah, maybe I can just punch through to the top. And as soon as I tried to move at all, I realized that I couldn't even bend a finger. So like they said, avalanches can be very powerful events and we're gonna spend the rest of tonight talking about how we can avoid those, being caught in those powerful events. So one of the things that we need to have to, in order to have an avalanche is we need strong over weak layering in the snowpack. That's what those avalanche forecasters are talking about when they issue a report. And that's what us as guides or even just recreationalists, we want you going out and thinking about what is underneath me. And in the basic sense, do I have strong snow over weak snow, just like was illustrated here in this video. And I just wanted to also bring up an example of an avalanche last year from Utah where they had exactly that. They had a strong layer of snow over weak layer. Um, this accident from Mill Creek Canyon in Utah, which was February of 2021, um, it killed four skiers in this avalanche. And it was during a period of time where across the Western US, we were no matter where you were living, California to Idaho to Utah to Montana, it was pretty widespread that we all had a really strong layer over some weak underlying snow and we were seeing a lot of avalanche accidents and a lot of fatalities. Um, so this accident here, and I recommend reading more about this accident if you do get a chance because it's pretty interesting and it brings in a lot of different factors that cause this avalanche. So. There was two parties skiing in this area on this day. So eight skiers total in two different groups. Six people were completely buried. Um, four unfortunately did not survive. And the avalanche hazard that day was hot. And in reading some of the reports of this incident, some people that did survive this accident talked about how they had gone out with the plan to avoid avalanche terrain. And it also, in this photo here where you can see all the different slope angles, it also highlights that it's not just about being in that prime avalanche terrain, it's also about being aware of the terrain that it's connected to. So speaking of terrain, that's obviously another component. So we need strong over weak layering and we need a slope that's steep enough to slide. 
The most important avalanche skill to learn is how to read avalanche terrain, which mainly means judging slope steepness. Almost all avalanches occur on slopes steeper than 30 degrees, but you know what? When the snow is sketchy, we can still have lots of fun playing on mellower terrain. We just want to make sure we're not on, underneath, or even connected to steeper slopes. The bottom line is the only time we should even consider getting into steep terrain is when we have safe avalanche conditions. Some slopes are going to produce much worse outcomes should they avalanche than other slopes. For example, if you're above a bunch of trees, rocks, cliffs, or you're gonna get washed into a lake or a gully, the outcome of getting caught in an avalanche like that is much worse than if you're in some big wide open meadow. So like they highlighted in the video is when we talk about avalanche terrain, we see most avalanches occur between 30 to 45 degrees. On, steep, on slopes that are steeper than 45 degrees, they tend to be too steep to slide um, but they often have those small sloughs coming off of it. And that's a whole nother animal to manage that you see in all those ski movies is they tend to be managing their slough after each turn. And then below 30 degrees, it's not steep enough for us to really see it slide. And so really that 30 to 45 degrees is that critical slope angle degree. And that's something too that takes practice looking at. And that even as you're going out early season or inbounds, that's a great thing to practice is starting to look at either slope shading maps or getting out an inclinometer and just practice measuring slope angles and comparing it to what your eye can see. The most likely avalanche starting to zone is 38 to 39 degrees. That's where we tend to see most avalanches where the crown breaks and that snow starts to slide. Um, but we also, like we said, we want to be aware of and just paying attention as we're going out to terrain that's connected to those start zones. So thinking about as you're stopping with your group and just in general when you're taking in the day and thinking about how you're going to travel through terrain, not just thinking about where you have, you know, that 30 to 45 degree slopes, but what's connected to it. Am I standing underneath avalanche terrain? is an important piece of just getting the whole picture while you're out there. Like they also mentioned in the video, there's definitely some places where being caught in an avalanche, you know, the consequences are increased. So essentially a little bit of snow could bury you if you were to be caught in something like a gully or a sharp transition, um, being swept over cliffs or rock fans, trees, or just a really large avalanche path. I think it's also important to think about what some of these places are inbounds. Um, and one example that always comes to mind for me is just cat tracks. They are a place inbounds that are a sharp transition. And so just also being wary of cat tracks and how you're moving through those on powder days inbounds as well. So that's a fun video that the Free Ride World Tour put out, but it has some really good information in it. So just to kind of recap that first part is the things that we need to have for an avalanche to happen is we need to have strong over weak layering. We need to have a slope that's steep enough to slide, which is at 30 to 45 degrees. And then we need some sort of trigger. Um, so those triggers can be people, they can be explosives, they can be a number of things. And 
like that free ride world tour video just got at too, is there certain days inbounds and not just in the back country that we want to think about those things and maybe be a little bit more conservative with our terrain choices, as well as thinking of if we're leaving any ski area boundaries, then we are in the backcountry and thinking about how we can be prepared for that and treating any time we're leaving the gates as backcountry skiing. The difference between riding in a ski resort and riding in the backcountry is really night and day. In a ski resort, we use explosives and terrain closure to minimize the risk of avalanches to our customers. But outside the ski area, once you step just two feet over that rope line, you're in a totally different environment. Anybody that's going into the backcountry or thinking about going off piste at a resort really needs to understand that it's a totally uncontrolled environment. There isn't any ski patrol, uh, they're not bombing or doing any avalanche control. It can be really dangerous. So essentially you need to be, you know, your own avalanche expert. So in nine out of 10 avalanche fatalities, they're triggered by the victim or somebody in the victim's party, which is actually good because it's not like getting struck by lightning. We have a choice. That means if we learn something about avalanches, we can avoid getting caught in avalanches. So to just switch gears for a minute and talk a little bit about just inbounds is in the past 10 years, there have been 13 fatalities that have occurred inbounds at U.S. resorts. Um, thankfully, there were zero inbounds fatalities last year. The prior year, so the 2019-2020 season, there was four inbounds fatalities caused by avalanches. So even if you are listening to this presentation and you predominantly ski inbounds, there's still certain days that you can activate hopefully this presentation and this part of your brain to think about it. And then keeping in mind that, you know, bigger picture, most avalanche accidents happen outside resort boundaries in the backcountry. Um, but there's a lot of avalanche accidents that happen just outside the ski area boundaries as well, where people are using lifts to access those ski area boundary gates. So in North America, we know that ski patrol does their best to control everything within the ski area boundaries and open terrain accordingly. Outside those gates, like we've said, it is the backcountry. And then in Europe and different parts of the world, it is a little bit different. And so that's one thing to just think about. And I see that there's definitely some people that are listening tonight that I know that travel internationally as coaches and with athletes. And if there's ever any question, um, ski patrol are the people to talk to about asking them, okay, what is controlled and what isn't controlled off piste in Europe is not, we, is, we can't assume that's controlled. Um, so that's a big difference just between the US and Europe in that example. And ski patrol is your best resource and also to just reading the avalanche forecast, even for days that you're skiing inbounds. So now we're gonna get into the get the points and we're first gonna talk about get the gear and get the training. So things that we can do leading into the season and things that we can be, be doing now. Everyone here tonight is checking the box of getting the training by listening to this presentation, which is awesome. Um, so gear that we want to carry when we're going into the backcountry, and I see these three things, the avalanche transceiver, avalanche probe, and shovel as the bare minimum. So the avalanche transceiver, we use that to find other avalanche transceivers, so they need to be worn correctly by ourselves and our partners. Um, we want to make sure at the beginning of every season that they are working correctly, so we want to check battery percentage, we want to make sure that they're able to pick up another transceiver so that the search mode is working. And then we also want to make sure that they're sending out a signal. And then at the beginning of each season, I also like to check the range of my avalanche transceiver. And every manufacturer is slightly different on what they recommend for battery percentage. 
Um, and there's a website, beaconreviews.com, that has, is a really good resource for finding the manual for your avalanche transceiver. So check those, make sure they're working, and most importantly, make sure your partners are working. And where we wanna wear them is we wanna wear them over our base layer, underneath our coats, so that we are gonna stay with that avalanche transceiver if something were to happen to us or our partners. Um, an avalanche probe, we wanna make sure we're carrying that. That would be if we were to have to search for someone, that would be the next step in our search. That's how we'd actually locate them once our, beak, our avalanche transceiver has honed in on that signal. And again, we wanna make sure we know how to put that together. And that's a piece of equipment that we're carrying inside of our backpacks so that we're not losing it. Same with our partners. And then avalanche shovel. Um, we want that to be durable and sturdy. Um, a metal shovel is the way to go. Um, and if you think about what you're gonna be shoveling through is avalanche debris is really similar to the berms that get built by the plow when they come through and they build those banks in parking lots and whatnot. Um, so that can be a great place to make sure that your shovel holds up, um, but that's, can be pretty firm and concrete like when it stops moving that avalanche debris. So you wanna make sure that you have a good shovel. Other gear that you can think about is definitely, you know, your brain reading the forecast and just looking around while you're out there, which we're gonna talk about a little bit more. Avalanche safety can seem totally overwhelming, you know, but there is a systematic step-by-step -step process that can keep you alive in avalanche terrain. Just knowing five basic things can prevent most avalanche accidents. Get the gear, get the training, get the forecast, get the picture, and get out of harm's way. Everyone who goes into backcountry avalanche terrain needs basic avalanche rescue gear. You need an avalanche transceiver, a shovel, and a probe. And you need to practice a lot to know how to use all of this gear because your friend only has about 15 minutes to live buried beneath the snow. A lot of people also use an inflatable avalanche airbag backpack that will help them rise to the top of avalanche debris. How well does this avalanche rescue gear actually work? Well, for one out of four people killed in an avalanche, they're gonna die from trauma. They're gonna hit trees or rocks on the way down the slope. So avalanche rescue gear isn't gonna do anything for them. The rest of them die from asphyxia, from breathing their own carbon dioxide underneath the snow. But it doesn't have to be that way. If everyone wore an avalanche airbag backpack, as well as an avalanche transceiver, two out of three people who die from asphyxia would still be alive. The bottom line is avalanche rescue gear will only save about half of us. But in order to stack the odds in my favor, I make sure to never go skiing without them. Sorry. So they talked a little bit more about gear in those videos, right? So again, if you are someone that owns an avalanche airbag, it's the same thing as with um, the other gear that I spoke about before is make sure that you test that before you're going out at the beginning of the season to make sure that that piece of gear works as well. And then again, practice, practice, practice. Even with this little bit of snow that we have here, I know that it's encouraged me to get out 
my avalanche transceiver and some of my spare transceiver and get together with some friends. And this is actually something I do every year and start doing some transceiver and rescue practice. So I'm ready when there's a little bit more in the back snow in the back country. So now that you've got the gear, you've got to get the training. So when you take an avalanche course, you're basically getting keys to a whole new world. You'll learn about avalanche terrain, snowpack, weather, rescue. Essentially, you're trying to take the guesswork out of travel in avalanche terrain. As a first timer just coming in, it's really important to take the right classes and gain all the knowledge before going out in the backcountry. Getting the training isn't just taking an avalanche class. It's a great start but really it's about practicing what you've learned. You know, make it a ritual, make it fun. You know, throw down some lunch money and do some time drills. You know, when it comes down to it, it's about having your friends back and knowing that they have yours. It's not just the skiers that need to get the training because sleds are taking us further into the backcountry. So we really need to bring our avalanche skills up to the level of our rider skills. Next, you got to get the forecast. These avalanche forecasters are pros. They're going to tell you everything you need to know. They're going to tell you about the snowpack. They're going to tell you about the weak layers. They're going to tell you where avalanches are going to happen, where you can likely avoid avalanches. All that information is one click away. To get the avalanche forecast, visit avalanche.ca in Canada or avalanche.org in the States. Before I even get on the snow, I check my local avalanche advisory. So take the time, get the forecast. So just to back up to get the training is here are a few resources on the screen. So ARI.org is one of the avalanche course providers in the US. There's a number of one, a number of other um, course providers as well, including the American Avalanche Institute, um, Silverton Mountain School depending where you live, but they have their list of all of their recreational level one and level two and rescue courses, avalanche.org. There's also usually an um, education section on there where you can look for local courses. Knowbeforeyougo.org has some great resources. And then also like they mentioned in the video, um, going to avalanche.org in the US or avalanche.ca in Canada and looking at the resources that a local avalanche center has near you. There's a lot of great presentations and um, free awareness and free, you know, they'll do free rescue training. So there's a lot of great resources out there that you can look into besides, you know, just presentations like this where you're actually getting out in the field. So things that we want to do every day when we go out, and they started getting into this in, in the video, is we want to get the forecast, get the picture, and get out of harm's way. So looking at the avalanche forecast is, this is the North American public avalanche danger scale. So we go from low to extreme, keeping in mind that these increase exponentially. So moderate isn't just a little bit more than low. Um, and with all these is there's travel advice and the likelihood of avalanches happening that's associated with each color. So if you haven't spent some time looking at the different danger levels in this format, I highly recommend that you do so. You can find that on avalanche.org or a lot of times if you're looking at the forecast, you can scroll over the color and it will take you to a page like this. Um, but I think it's important. So for example, considerable, the travel advice is dangerous avalanche conditions, careful snowpack evaluation, cautious route finding, and conservative decision making is essential. So it gives you some clues as to what you should be thinking about as to the terrain that you're going in that day. Terrain is the one thing when we're going out that we have control over. Do we go on that 40 degree slope or is the avalanche forecast considerable that day? And it's telling me, well, maybe I need to keep it under 30 degrees that day and still have some really fun skiing. It's also gonna tell you the likelihood that natural avalanches and human avalanches can happen and roughly the size of those avalanches. 
So that's all just what they mean and a little bit more meaning behind the colors. This is just breaking it down a little bit even more simply. Um, but an important part of this slide is that most avalanche accidents occur when the hazard is considerable or moderate. So the forecast is going to also tell us what the problem is on that day, um, where the problem has been observed. So what aspect are we seeing it on? Are we seeing it on north and northeast slopes? Are we seeing this on all slopes? And then how the weather is going to be that day. This is also just these avalanche forecasts are really good resources for just mountain weather. This is the same thing. This is just showing you slightly different graphics. Every avalanche center might have slightly different graphics, but they're all giving you the same information. And you can see on here, they have these little eyes on this example. So if this were a live website and you were to scroll over that eye, you can click on that and it's going to tell you what is a wind slab. Um, what, how are you supposed to read and, tr and interpret this aspect and elevation? Um, so all the clues are in there so that you don't have to remember it at all. And when we're checking the forecast, we're checking that the morning, maybe the night before, I know that um, if I'm going to a new area that I haven't skied in before, or ridden in before, I'm going to be checking the avalanche forecast maybe two weeks prior to me going to that new spot. And then every day, regardless if I'm going in the backcountry or not, I'm reading the avalanche forecast here. And some of that too, if you're new to reading avalanche forecasts is just to get used to the terminology. When you're traveling in the backcountry, you gotta get the picture. What's that mean? It means pay attention. Look for recent avalanches. Listen for cracking or whomping that's taking place around you. Look for recent storm snow, wind loaded snow. Look for rapid thawing. If you look for all these things, you're gonna get the picture. You're gonna be a safer backcountry skier. So like Chris Davenport was talking about is when we go out there too, we basically, we wanna think about the avalanche forecast as that's given us some initial clues. And then when we're out there, we essentially, we wanna trust, but verify. Are we seeing what they talked about in the avalanche forecast? What else am I observing that might be pertinent for the day? And remembering too, that just because there's tracks on the slope, doesn't necessarily mean it's safe to ski. We don't know when they skied it, what their decision was. So making sure that we're making decisions with our group that you feel good about. Some really obvious or red flags that we call them is recent avalanche activity. So if we see recent avalanche activity on a slope that we were thinking about skiing that day, that should be a clue to us. Okay, that happened on a Northeast aspect at about 9,000 feet. That was exactly the run we were thinking of skiing today. Maybe that's not such a good idea today and we need to go to our backup plan. Cracking or collapsing. So if you've ever been out and you've heard that like whoomp sound, um, you've actually created an avalanche. A lot of times when we hear that sound, we're just, we've created an avalanche. We're not on a slope that's steep enough to slide. So where you can commonly get those whoops are cracking and collapsing a lot of time is in a big open meadow and again that should make your hairs raise a little bit and be like okay i think i need to keep it conservative today um, if you're getting that when you're not in avalanche terrain because then when you are in a slope that's steep enough to slide you are likely to be caught in an avalanche um, recent wind drifted snow so the wind has a really great ability to transport snow and so any times we have high winds or we're seeing it up high on the ridge tops, that's something that we also really wanna be paying attention to. Rain or new snow, right? Just anything adding weight to the snowpack. The snowpack does not like rapid change, especially. So if you're out there and you're like, wow, it is really starting to come down in the last hour, maybe we wanna think about easing back our plan a little bit because all of a sudden that snowpack has more weight on it and it may or may not be adjusting well to that. And then any evidence of rapid thawing. So in the springtime is when we tend to see this the most. And there are a lot of times a clue for this is you see those like roller balls that are coming down.
Oh, sorry about that. Um, so then the next get the point is get out of harm's way. So how do we do that? Um, this is a picture of an avalanche that I believe was in Colorado in April, several years ago. And this is the debris field. And you can see this picture here. This is how far down, and that's a person um, to give you some scale of how deep the person, one of the people was buried that was caught in it. And so we also always need to be thinking and getting out of harm's way and getting the picture in my mind go hand in hand because we're thinking about like, where do we want to put ourselves? Where do we want to put our group as we're stopping, as we're eating lunch and taking breaks so that we're out of the way and or just assessing conditions. You get out of harm's way in the backcountry by first avoiding suspect slopes and terrain to begin with. We don't want to regroup in avalanche paths and we don't want to stop or regroup in runout zones. Some of my best advice I can give you is when we're out hill climbing and there's a bunch of us, don't go park right at the bottom in the avalanche path. Park on the outside, stay out of harm's way. Just like you ski a slope one person at a time, once you're at the bottom, get out of the way of the avalanche path. So a couple techniques that we can use so that we can get out of harm's way is skiing one at a time, or if we do feel like we have to cross the slope, maybe it's springtime, our avalanche hazard's a little bit lower and um, we feel like we can cross the slope, is spreading out or skiing or riding one, one at a time, but also thinking that it's not just a downhill technique, that we can also use one at a time or giving ourselves some space on the uphill. And so in addition to those five get the points is all of this, especially when we were talking about getting the gear, but getting out of harm's way, all of this includes us having a team in the backcountry. So whether it's myself and one other person or three other people, that's our team for the day. So it's super important that we're communicating well. We are checking in with our plan again. Okay, I just saw recent avalanche activity on this slope. I'm a little bit nervous about skiing our plan A. Maybe we just wanna ski back down this ridge line, or maybe we wanna ski this lower angle terrain that we looked at this morning. Um, keeping an eye on our partners. Um, and also making sure that part of that communication plan is, does everyone have the right gear? I know that there's definitely embarrassingly been a couple of times that I've gotten to a trailhead and either I've forgotten a piece of avalanche rescue gear or one of my partners had. And if we don't have extras with us, then unfortunately we're adjusting our plan already. <laughs> um, so just checking in with each other and recognizing not only is that your team for the day, but that's also your rescue party for the day. And if anyone is bringing up concerns, then we want to be able to listen to that and create an environment where they can speak up about something that they're not liking. And keeping in mind too, that whether it's myself as an avalanche professional or as a, you know, recreationalist, and especially as people who spend time in the mountains is your input really matters. And those are right, those are some of the human factors of just traveling in this. And that's why we try and use these systematic approaches of looking at the forecast the night before, checking our gear at the beginning of the season to make sure that everything's working is we wanna be doing all this so that we can eliminate as many of those human factors as possible. I think that one thing that I've definitely noticed um, just being around ski racing for so much of my life, but I think this is true for coaches, athletes, anyone who's a competitive snow sport athlete or has spent some time in that environment is a lot of time people assume that because you're a ski racer or you're a big mountain skier or you're a border cross rider that 
because your riding ability is so high that your avalanche education level must match that. And I think that's something that we need to be really aware of in our community is that people are sometimes going to assume that of us. And we need to think about that when we're getting our group together, when we're going out and figuring out how that plays into the day and recognizing, okay, I might be a World Cup skier, but I really haven't been able to spend that much time in the backcountry and my avalanche knowledge is here right now. So I don't know that I should be going and skiing that big peak with this group we're with today. Or maybe you have a different group and you're like, this makes sense, but just recognizing the difference in those two abilities. Um, and then just also not being afraid to turn around is a social pressure for sure that we all face out there. Everyone, including avalanche experts as well, or avalanche professionals, is you have that day off, you've been excited about this objective, and just having that commitment to that objective. I could spend a whole nother hour at least talking about times that I've turned around in the mountains, and sometimes I've gotten some confirmation that that was a good decision, whether it was there ended up being an avalanche up there um, or you know, some rock ball or something else happened, or there's been other times I've turned around and I haven't gotten that feedback. But the most important thing to me and where I can feel good about making those decisions is that I'm still here to keep skiing each day. And so just keeping all of these human factors in mind too, of uh, when you're out with your group is in the positive, you wanna have people that you feel good, you can communicate with and that you trust and they're gonna have their, your back they're going to have your back and you're going to have theirs. We want you to realize that avalanches are dangerous, but you can avoid getting caught in them. First, get the gear, but then you've got to get the training before ever going into the backcountry. Next, always check your local avalanche forecast so you can anticipate the given avalanche conditions for the day. You can get the picture by looking for the obvious signs of instability and you'll be getting out of harm's way by managing your exposure to potentially hazardous slopes. A lot of times when people watch us in the films, all they see is the action of us shredding these big lines. But what you don't see is the behind the scene, all the prep that goes into making sure that the slopes are safe, checking out the snowpack, waiting for snow to settle, doing all the homework it takes to safely rip the big lines. All this information is great and incredibly practical. But at the end of the day, if you feel uneasy about something, it's about having the courage to say no and walk away. The mountain isn't going anywhere. It doesn't matter if you've made thousands of good calls. All it takes is one bad call, and that's one too many. Some days the mountains are screaming, get out of here. And some days the mountains are going, come on in. It's time to party. Thanks for listening, everyone. And I think Tom's gonna come back in and we're going to answer any questions that people might have. So you can put those in either the Q&A or in the chat box. And yeah, for anyone that does have to sign off, definitely thank you for listening. Um, but we do hope you stick around. Nyman has joined us and we're going to show the full length of Off Piste. Yeah, thanks everybody. Great presentation, Lindsay. We're happy to answer any questions. You can put them into the chat or you can put them into the Q&A. And uh, thanks for your comments, Jim Tracy, a longtime coach uh, back again. They took the class last year back again. Refreshers are always really, really important. 
you know, just while we're waiting for a few questions, any simple tips, I know you covered this in more detail, Lindsay, but any simple tips for what we should be thinking about right now in mid-November with the ski season just around the corner? Yeah, so I think the biggest thing is the get the gear and the get the training piece that we were talking about. So I know I kind of woke up this morning, I looked out the window and it was snowing. And one of the first things I thought about was, okay, so it's probably time for me to store my mountain bike for the winter and get out and figure out, you know, where's my avalanche transceiver, where's my spare transceiver and get out and start practicing some transceiver searches and making sure that all of that gear works and doing that with my partners. I mean, I know I've talked a lot about, or I've said several times now of just checking the gear. But that is stuff too that we're doing every day when we go out in the parking lot. And it's just such a bummer when you get to that first backcountry ski of the season and you're psyched and your transceiver doesn't work or you realize that your probe's broken. So I think just checking that now, including, you know, just your skis and your bindings, things that we do to ski inbounds as well. Great, thanks. And uh, a question from Stefan. Uh, Lindsay, what do you use to measure the slope angle? Are there different ways to do that? Are there tools that you can use? Yeah, so the short answer, Stefan, is uh, thanks for the question. There are a lot of apps for that now. So um, there's a couple different apps, but an inclinometer you can use on your phone. And basically, you just take a ski pole and you lay it down on the slope, and then you can put your phone on top of it with the inclinometer and it's going to tell you what the slope angle is. Um, other tools that I use as well is there's various mapping apps that I have. So I have CalTopo and I also actually have Gaia. Um, and if you upgrade and get the professional version, both of those have actually slope angle shading overlays. So it's another way that I can look on my topo map and get a general idea of, you know, what the slope angle is of the terrain. And I actually, just as a fun fact, I did that overlay on Beaver Creek and it was pretty interesting <laughs> to see like how steep parts of that um, race course are. It's amazing the overlays that you can get. I personally use Gaia. I use it in the summertime and the wintertime, and there's just about nothing you can't find uh, in overlays. You can find out exactly where your cell coverage is. You can look at, get a pretty good idea on snowpack, and the uh, slope angle overlay is pretty helpful, too. Uh, we got another question from Robert Skinner. Uh, is anybody using Avalungs anymore, and what's the difference uh, from the inflatable packs? Um, so Avalungs at this point are now a little bit of outdated technology and most people are just going to airbags. So for those of you that don't know, an Avalong was basically, like they said in the video, is that some people die from, that are caught in avalanches from asphyxiation. And so the Avalong technology is you would put a tube in your mouth and then as you were exhaling CO2, it would go out the back of your backpack and giving you more time to survive underneath the snow was the theory. The key to that is you had to get that tube in your mouth when you were skiing and have it stay in your mouth when it was skiing. Um, and they're not really making those anymore, but airbag packs is basically now, um, they come in a little bit different forms. There's ones that operate on battery. There's others that operate on CO2 cartridges. Um, and then there's a fan system as well. But basically you pull um, a, whatever, a tab, a handle is the word, um, on your backpack and it inflates like a big neck pillow. And the idea is like the Brazilian nut theory that if you were to shake up a bunch of bar nuts is that the biggest knot, the Brazilian is gonna to float to the top. And so the idea is that if you were to be caught, you pull your airbag, it's gonna give you more chance of staying on the surface of the avalanche. Obviously things like trees, if you're in a really like, if you're tree skiing, that can puncture the airbag. But like you see tons of people um, that are heli skiing in Alaska, use them because that's great terrain for the airbag to work really well. 
Lindsay, can you talk a little bit about RECO reflectors? I know you touched on it in the presentation, but a little bit more on how that technology works and what the value is and how important it is in your complement of tools. So a lot of clothing brands now make RECO reflectors in it. And so that is basically, you know, there's whatever a little chip in it or whatever it is. And then a lot of ski patrols and more and more um, search and rescue have basically the transceiver that can find the RECO reflectors in people's clothing. Um, and I know from talking to ski patrollers is basically if there were to be an inbound avalanche for any reason, first they would, you know, they're going to come with transceivers right away, but then they're also going to come in with RECO transceivers and be looking for anyone that way. So um, it's just another piece of technology that it's like, why not? And talking to ski patrollers too, I've asked, okay, what if there were to be an inbound avalanche? I was a bystander. I have a coat with RECO on it. He said, you can always cut that out, <laughs> but you can never put it on when you don't have it. So I think that if you are buying jackets and you see that piece of technology in it, why not? Yeah, it's a good point. Thanks for that info, Lindsay. Uh, do we have any final questions? We have time for one or two more before we bring Stephen Nyman in to uh, talk. Anybody else with a question for Lindsay Mann tonight? If not, Lindsay, we want to thank you for this valuable 45-minute uh, session. It is just great uh, introductory content, uh, uh, and we really appreciate the effort that you put in and your support of Brass. Thank you. Thanks everybody for listening and I will turn it over to everyone else. Thanks again. Great. Thank you very much, Lindsay. And thanks to all of you for sticking around. We're now going to get to some more fun stuff. And we have joining us from, I think, Copper Mountain. I'm not certain of this, but uh, U.S. Ski Team Downhill Star, Stephen Nyman. Stephen, where are you tonight? You got it. Copper Mountain. How's training been at Copper so far? It's been fantastic. Uh, the snow, the slope is basically halfway prepared. Uh, they have we got to ski to the bottom today and actually loop on the lift instead of snowmobiles. So our laps are much faster. Um, and we've had a good progression starting with kind of the upper, upper third now to about halfway to two thirds of the way down. And then soon we're going to be doing full length downhill. And next thing you know, I'm going to be in Lake Louise. So I'm really nice. fired up, feeling balanced, feeling good on my skis and uh, happy with the way I feel. You've been bouncing back from injury, and I know you had a good camp over in Zermatt. How's your progress so far, and do you feel ready for the opening of the season? Uh, to be honest, first camp, I, I went to Zermatt twice. The first camp, I was rusty. I was, <laughs> I was not skiing very well. Um, it had been about a year and a half since I'd skied downhill, um, but we were blessed with a great surface, and I was able to dial my equipment in, and <clears throat> it was glacial snow over there, so um very very compact ice and i i set everything up the way i thought it should be set up and i thought maybe i'm going to go to copper and it's just going to be way too aggressive and uh it feels great everything just feels aligned and uh it, since i have that comfort i'm willing to push for more and more and more and um hopefully i can get back on the podium once again that must have been a really good feeling. I know that it's been a struggle for you, but you've persevered through this thing. So you're looking ahead now to Lake Louise and Beaver Creek, right? Tell us what your expectations are there. Um, expectations, I, I don't like to put expectations upon myself. I like to just know what I am trying to accomplish and I know what it takes to win. Um, and so it's just, preparing myself to be able to do that. And now am I capable of doing that on my skis? And right now I feel like uh, I, I am capable. And so we get to train with a lot of the other nations. Today was Norway, France, Italy, and us all together. So I got to kind of test my speed against other nations and I look pretty good. Sweet. As you look at the other nations, who's hot right now? Anybody that's kind of stood out uh, in the camps in Europe or, or at Copper this week? Um, today was the first time training with the French and I was not very good the first run. I, I, I kind of had to knock some rust off, but then, uh, 
as it went on, I started getting faster and faster, but first run till uh, through the whole thing, the French Johan Clary and Adrian Taro were skiing quite fast. So, and Dominic Paris looks good and obviously killed it. And Jansrud were um, throwing it in there as well. So. Well, let's uh, actually one one question on Beaver Creek, and then we're going to move on to your favorite race course. But Beaver Creek has always been an amazing experience for the American downhillers to go in there. Uh, how important is it to have that support? And it looks like you're going to probably have some fans back this year. <laughs> fans are great. Um, actually, I just got done with uh, the team naming in Copper Mountain here, and it was a great event. There was several hundred people cheering us on, the passion of the kids, a lot of questions. Um, it's just motivating to have that and see the, the fire of ski racing in America right now. Uh, but Beaver Creek, it's just a unique situation. You're in that basin. You have a lot of people cheering you on and, and just pulling you to the finish. It's just something that I get so fired up for every year and I missed it last year. And I'm really, really excited to try and tackle the birds of prey once again. So let's move on to Italy and Val Gardena, the Sasslong course, one of the gnarliest, nastiest courses on the World Cup Tour, but somehow you figured out the secret there. Does it kind of feel a little bit like going home when you roll into the, the valley there in the Dolomites? Yeah, we have uh, our, our hotel there. The uh, Demetz is the father. He has been um running that race for i don't know how many years now he, he's just been the backbone of that race and they welcome us with open arms and and honestly the hotel there is the worst hotel we stay at all year long <laughs> but they just cook us the best food and it's just family and uh when the women went there and raced a few years ago they put the women up in the nicest hotel in town and they loved it so much that those people invited us to stay at the nicest hotel in town. And we said, nah, well, we'll stay here. <laughs> sometimes, you know, it's more than, than the decor or the quality of the hotel. It's that, that whole atmosphere. Stephen, what is it? You've won three times on that course. Is, is there something about it that just really suits your style of skiing? Um, I, think, I think it suits American skiing, actually. Uh, we have a lot of amazing results there. I'm actually the only person ever went there, but we've had a lot of people in the top 10 there. Um, and I should say win the downhill. Several guys have won the, the Super G, but um, I, I would say it's the terrain and the ability to go over the terrain with full conviction. Um, people who 90% of the field are going to go with hesitation you can't there's so many blind rolls and you you cannot see where you're going and if you can convince yourself that you're going in the right direction and you're going to go over those rolls with uh gusto you're going to carry speed but you you have to know what's ahead of you and you have to be ready um i've i've won there a few times but i've also had a lot of really nice crashes so <laughs> um you got to be ready for anything well, let's get you down to the finish line. Uh, let's take a brief look at Beijing. Nobody knows really what to expect. Nobody's been on the course. Uh, coaches will go over and check things out. But are you hearing anything about the Beijing downhill? And, you, you know, any thoughts on what we can expect to see in February? I've seen some video. And the video of the piece looks quite fun, actually. It's, it's like a dragon's back going down the ridge of this mountain and lots of terrain changes and winding undulations um lots of there is some steep open faces there's some flats uh but what i think is really cool about the olympics this year is we don't even have the ability usually we go in there and we set up shop and we have our hotel and we kind of make us feel very comfortable but um that's not the case we're in olympic housing the same as everyone um and nobody skied the course so it's an even playing field and nobody has any advantages this year so i think going in there with an open mind willing to learn the hill and explore and really convince yourself of what's possible is going to be the ticket to winning 
Yeah, it'll be interesting to watch even playing field for everybody. Let's go back in time a little bit and talk about avalanche safety. Stephen, seven years ago, Bryce and Ronnie lost their lives in an avalanche and sold. And uh, you being the kind of mentor figure that you've been in the team, you knew those two athletes. And I'm sure that for you and others, it was a huge impact when we lost them. Very well. Uh, both of them were friends of mine. I've always tried to welcome all the young kids onto the team. And uh, Bryce in particular, I had supported him through his younger years and given him suits and really watched his career blossom. And it, it, I, I have, um, sorry, I'm just kind of choking up, but uh, TJ Lanning, my, my good buddy, he came in the room and he was just pale white and he just, he was just, I was like, what's up, what's up? And he told me what had happened and that just, um, crush me and uh, to to prevent that from happening is why I'm here and if we can educate everyone and get everybody on board to realize that this is real and safety is real and um, the the importance of knowing before you go and understanding terrain and understanding how powerful the mountains can be is uh, is so so important and hopefully we can ingrain that in the children. Stephen you have been a vital part of the board of brass for a number of years and one of its biggest advocates. Uh, have you sensed through this uh, that there's a changing attitude among racers and teams uh, around the country to be more understanding of these dangers and to go and get some education so they can be better prepared? Very much so. Um, <clears throat> I actually picked up my family and moved to Europe throughout the winter. And we have four sets of gear over there that is, is available to anyone. And we loan it out and, and everybody asks for it if they're going out. And um, other guys do bring things over there, sets of gear. So um, it's on everybody's mind. And we need, to, we need to get that in the coaches' minds, get that in the kids' minds to realize like, this is this is a reality like this is a danger and um i think the scariest thing is in america we ski amongst such controlled environments and we get very lackadaisical with our thought and action and um when kids get good enough and start going to europe and experiencing the mountains over there it's it's huge and it's real and it's not controlled and we need to uh um, teach them that this can happen anywhere. And I think with the, the movement to the back country right now, it's very important as well. Stephen Nyman, thank you so much for joining us from the camp at Copper Mountain, the U.S. Ski Team Speed Center there. We look forward to watching you from Lake Louise and hopefully being trackside at Beaver Creek and uh, have a great season. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Tom. Thanks for your fun. work. That was Stephen Nyman uh, joining us tonight from Copper Mountain. We're going to close off this session of uh, Brass 101 with a showing of Off Piste, a film that was released uh, almost four years ago and has been seen by over a million people to bring the message of avalanche safety. It's a tough film to watch, but it's an important one. I want you to sit back and learn some lessons in this film. And when you're done, uh, think about sending this link to somebody else. Send them to the Brass website at brassavalanche.org. And as always, if you can support Brass, you're going to help to carry this message to many, many more people. You can donate at brassavalanche.org. Let's take a look now at Off Piste. Starting CPR. One, two, three, four, 
Lift on three. One, two, three. Are you sure there were only two? Yeah, there's two. Just two, just two. Okay, we're gonna find him. Riley! Not breathing, no pulse. Sorry, CPR. can turn deadly in a matter of seconds. It's hard to believe that such a tragedy could happen. The accident has left many in the skiing world in shock. Tragic news tonight as two elite skiers training for a spot on the U.S. Olympic team are killed in an avalanche. Rescue crews from Solden were on the scene immediately with multiple helicopters. Our thoughts and prayers are with those who are apparently lost in this uh, specific incident. I'm Bryce Astle. How does the gangster chains play into effect in your slalom skiing? Um, pretty aerodynamic. I was shattered and I know everyone around me was too and can't even possibly imagine what it was like for the families. Losing Bryce and Ronnie was a huge hit to the US team. They're the next generation. These two guys were the best in their disciplines. Uh, Bryce in slalom, Ronnie in downhill and super G. They were the next up and comers. They could be the guys competing in the Olympics. This is the famous smile because uh, he had just won U.S. Nationals, Juniors. He always had my back and it just, it makes you appreciate it more now that he's not here, you know? Bryce was such an important part of my life and after we lost him, it was a pretty easy decision for my wife and I to name our son Bryce. He lived for every moment. He would get done training and he would go out and he would ski. And this is a card that we made up at the time we lost the boys and it has Bryce so amazing on skis and Ronnie in his element going 70 miles an hour through the air. He was kind, and he was grounded. Ronnie, he was always just a jokester. He wasn't afraid of the, the World Cup vet. He would just always speak his mind to me, and I love that about him, you know? Watching him laughing just made me think, wow, I have the best brother ever. He was a good teammate, he was a good friend, a good son, and we had a lot of fun together. January 1st, 2015, I took Bryce to the airport. He was gonna hook up with uh, Ronnie Burlack and the rest of the US ski team. They were going to Europe to uh, train for uh, Europa Cup. We got to Solden and it had just snowed a lot. Obviously there's no training because there's so much snow. So we sent everyone out to go ski around and have some fun. Just seeing snow that's untouched and being like, this is a dream come true. We were having an amazing time. We could see the bottom of the valley, we could see the road, so we started skiing. I just remember skiing across this face and all of a sudden I just heard cracking. <laughs> Everything underneath me started moving. I saw Bryce and I heard him say oh shit. I never even saw Ronnie. We stood there and we watched them go. Nothing made any sense. <laughs> then it 
then it just instinct took over and there were people who had skied down right before us who saw everything and pulled out their transceivers. Oh, they're wearing beacons. No, no beacons. No, 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 no avalanche equipment. I need shovels, I need shovels. That was when I realized how stupid we were being. Okay, does anybody have a probe? We're at the bottom of Solden 1. We need a helicopter, two more patrollers, hasty team, then AED. Probably took 15 minutes for helicopters to come in. I was like pretty aware that it had been too long. The first thing that appeared was Bryce's boots sticking up out of the snow. He was upside down. His boot was six feet from the surface. Came across Ronnie a few minutes later. Ronnie, you got him. Did you get him out of the hole? That was an image that I'll never forget. The concept of riding up a lift, skiing on a trail, and we're in danger, that did not exist in any of our heads. The coaches and the boys did not receive any orientation or any training regarding the dangers of skiing in Europe versus skiing in North America. None of the young men in that group knew the difference between on and off piste. Off piste in the United States is defined as out of bounds, going through the gate, going under the rope. That's not what the rules are in Europe. When you are off the groomer, you are off piste. In Solden, the day before the avalanche that killed Bryce and Ronnie, there had been heavy snowfall and strong winds. What that did was, is it put a lot of weight on top of the snowpack, which was fragile. Once these skiers got onto that slope, it couldn't support the additional weight. That weak layer fractured over a wide area, and that slab came crashing down. It produced debris that weighed almost 7 million pounds, the same as almost 10 747s. It takes all of 20 minutes to, to learn and to be educated. You want to make sure you're prepared. There are five points that are always really good to remember. You want to get the gear, get the training, get the forecast, get the picture, and get out of harm's way. First, you need the gear. Going in the backcountry, you need a beacon, a probe, and a shovel. And unfortunately, that day in Solon, the boys did not have that. Ronnie! I would have done anything for rescue gear, especially a shovel. You can always increase your chances of being searchable if you're unlucky enough to be caught in an avalanche by having reco reflectors in your equipment and clothing. Getting the gear is useless if you don't know how to use it. You've got to get the training. Take an avalanche class. If we would have taken just one class, we would have known not to ski down that terrain in the first place. One key thing you're going to learn in every avalanche class is that you have to check the forecast every time you ride. None of us checked the forecast that morning. It would have taken just two minutes on the gondola ride, and none of this would have happened. So when you're out on the snow, you got to get the picture. And what does that mean? That means pay attention. Are you seeing recent avalanches? That's by far the most important clue. That's like Mother Nature screaming in your ear. If we had known it wasn't controlled, we 100% would not have been there. Finally, get out of harm's way. What that means is only one person is riding the slope at a time. We were breaking one of the simplest rules. In some ways, it's a miracle that all six of us didn't die. Once you get to the bottom, you need to get out of the way. That way, if somebody else in your group triggers an avalanche, you won't be caught. These five simple steps everyone should know about and everybody should be trained in. Coaches, parents, athletes, administrators of the program. Everything that we did could have easily been prevented. I wish I could say that I couldn't have done anything to save their lives. 
that's just not true. Anytime you have a major accident like this, it causes a ton of introspective thought. We realized that we really needed to look at it from the top down, bottom up. How can we make sure everybody's more educated to avert and reduce the chance of anything like this ever happening again? That's why we at Brass are creating avalanche education specifically for coaches and athletes. We're also creating snow safety policies to be followed by ski racing groups. Ski racing is definitely a dangerous sport. But what we're going down is a really highly regulated area. You have all the fencing, you have the snow prep, you have all these things that are out there to keep you safe. When you get out there in the backcountry, there's, there's none of those luxuries. For the people who assume that just because they know how to ski terrain or they know how to rip down a mountain because they ski downhill, it's, it's a very different beast. Don't let this happen to you and your family. Get educated, get out there, so we can keep skiing for Bryce and Ronnie, so their legacies live on. Thanks to everyone who joined us here tonight for some education, a uh, chance to chat with Stephen Nyman, and for watching off the Keys. You've made a difference for yourself and those around you by the education that you've gained tonight. Please tell a friend and stop by BrassAvalanche.org and make a donation so that others can have the same opportunity that you did this evening. Thanks everybody and good night. <laughs>